Welcome to Face to Face, and today we're going to talk about nonviolence. We're going to talk about disobedience, resistance. We're going to talk about a new book coming out, and I'm with Michael Beer, uh, who is just author of the Tactic of uh, Resistance. And uh, welcome to Face to Face. It's great to be here. So you let's let's first uh, maybe introduce yourself. Uh, and then explain what is the Nonviolence International, and then uh, we will go deeper into the book. Wonderful. Uh, I'm Michael Beer, Director of Nonviolence International, an organization which promotes nonviolence all over the world since 1989. We do training, we do advocacy because we follow the dictum of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who said, the world has a choice between nonviolence and non-existence. And so we really believe that nonviolence is preferable to non-existence. And therefore nonviolence is not just some nice thing to do or belief system, but is essential for the survival of the planet and humanity. And we, uh, in recent years, have realized that there has been nonviolent movements and resistance operating in all countries of the world, even in repressive societies such as North Korea and Myanmar, and that this enormous range and diversity of nonviolent tactics has not been recently documented and studied and yeah. we've begun doing that yeah. at nonviolence international because it's an exciting important endeavor uh that humanity is engaging in and it needs to get recognized and supported more well, welcome home because Presenza is founded on on the on that uh, logic of nonviolence and peace during the 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 World March for Peace and Nonviolence back in 2009, and that's really our foundation of uh, as a humanist why we uh, we we chose nonviolence because for human being is no is is no process of humanity with violence. So uh, now let's let's talk more about the book itself and how did you? Uh, um, I mean, I know it it it, it exists a little bit before in in different format, but you you make a collection of tactic tactic of uh, um, civil disobedience. Yes, we uh, began collecting examples of nonviolent methods or tactics about four or five years ago. And we have this in a tactics database that we've just launched, tactics.nonviolenceinternational.net. And you can see 350 tactics in nonviolence used uh, from around the world and throughout history. This number keeps growing. We've written a book uh, that is a companion to the database. And the book outlines not just some examples from the database, but also talks about the why we're having such a explosion and nonviolent explosion uh, of creativity and nonviolent tactics. And we talk about the how nonviolent tactics actually work. And then we categorize them in uh, useful ways. Some of them are confrontational. Many of them are confrontational. And some of them are constructive. And people usually think understandably about nonviolent tactics as being disruptive, which they often are. But they can also be disruptive in a constructive way uh, and do positive uh, um, uh, creative things uh, and functions for society. So I think in Myanmar, no, Myanmar was very interesting lately about what what they were doing and how they were organizing against uh, the military dictatorship, and they were like doing a, a parallel government or the parallel uh, 
uh, education system or parallel else? Um, I don't know. Yes, Myanmar is an example of a what the scholars say is a maximalist kind of nonviolent struggle where you really are going up for against a military struggling for leadership or control of a country the opposition has formed a opposition or a parallel government called the NUG the National Union government and they are trying to create a parallel government that they believe the vast majority of the people will follow as opposed to the military coup regime which currently claims itself to be the rulers of the country and so that's an example of a kind of a constructive nonviolent project uh, they have a foreign minister who travels around the world they have health ministers and whatnot they're trying at the township or local level, ward level, village level, to have tax collectors and to yeah. uh, maintain control at the local level as well. Yeah, they reward the taxes. And I mean, it's, it's very powerful. I thought it was very interesting. Um, we know that a lot of marginalized people around the world um, don't have access to traditional power through elections or through economic power, because much of the world is very poor, and through uh, uh, other institutional means like the court systems in their countries, which are corrupt or not functioning well. Nonviolent action really encapsulates almost all of the other ways that people can organize, particularly through social power, people power, everything that's outside these kind of traditional institutions of legislation and elections and courts and everything else we throw into this box that we call nonviolent resistance and so it's an enormous range of human behavior whether it's hunger strikes we saw that recently with navalny in russia who no succeeded shot. in getting his medical attention that he wanted in prison Mm -hmm. uh, we see boycotts uh, that are used regularly where people refuse to buy um, items or services. This is happening a lot around Myanmar at the moment, mm -hmm. where people in the country are refu refusing to buy Myanmar beer mm -hmm. and its revenues are down 80%. Or strikes where people withhold their labor. And there are many strikes, of course, at going on at any one time all over the world for many good causes. And there are now many new forms of digital resistance that we're seeing around the world. The internet has been invented. People are expressing themselves on the internet. We have hashtags. We have people changing their personal profiles. We have digital games. We have some things that are sometimes not so nonviolent, like digital mobbing or doxing or uh, other kinds of action uh, online that, where people are expressing themselves and organizing. As you mentioned about the internet, and I wanted to see with you how this internet expansion development in many parts of the world have changed the nonviolence process because we saw it with Occupy Movement, we saw it with uh, with Myanmar, we saw it with many situations where in Turkey and so on and so forth, the government has even have to go to block the internet to, in some ways, uh, uh, saddle down the, the, the rebellion. So um, if you can describe a little bit more, because that's a new, in some ways, a new process to nonviolence. Yes, uh, no question that the internet has had a dramatic impact on nonviolent movements and people's ability to co collaborate and cooperate and communicate on a massive global scale if necessary. So one of the ways that the internet has had an impact is it amplifies existing nonviolent struggle. 
So, for example, in Moscow, if somebody did a solo protest in Red Square or somewhere, in the past, maybe somebody took a photograph, uh, but very few people would see that protest. Now you can do a one-person protest, and if you mark it successfully or you have a good luck and uh, yeah. interesting issue, uh -huh. you can uh, amplify through a video of your protest to the entire world, if, if conceivably. So that the amplification uh, of protest, of ordinary protest, through the use of basically video and audio has dramatically uh, impacted our societies. In addition, I would say that the internet now has a world and a life of its own. And so that you can have a very big impact by doing digital work on the camera, on your computer, and impacting other people in the digital universe, which is a lot of the people around the world. And so the internet itself is a place for nonviolent protest. That's true. I always say expression. if you can get to the phone, you can get, <laughs> you are in good shape. <laughs> there are another way that the modern technology and digital technologies has had a big impact. It relates to this amplification issue, but it has to do with a new term called surveillance. S O U S valence. This is from the French word for under. Yeah. And as opposed to surveillance, which is what the regimes and the corporations and the governments do to the people, uh -huh. the people are able to surveil with their camera phones and other technology and from below can observe the authorities and expose the authorities. One of the best examples of this is the George Floyd uh, murder in which we had citizens using their cameras and they were surveilling the police and holding the police accountable for what they did. And we're seeing that this has a very big impact uh, particularly if the surveillance is then shared with the world, uh, can have a really big impact on trying to hold the authorities accountable. Of course, there's a big contest now between corporations and governments which are using surveillance uh, to try to control populations and the people power using surveillance to counter that and uh, uh, hold authorities and governments accountable. Very interesting. Very interesting. And how do you think is is going? Is going? I mean, it's. I mean, it's. It's a very interesting example for the the Floyd situation we have seen here in the U.S., where really, I mean, without the video, it will have been nothing. I mean, it will have right. been no case at all. The the video did everything uh, during the court. That was very clear. I mean, the testimony of some of the witness was powerful. But without the video, I agree with you, it will have been impossible to, to, to have a case uh, as he went to. The authorities are having a hard time. I mean, they're doing an amazing job of surveilling us. I mean, the amount of information that governments know about us and, and corporations know about us is extraordinary and very concerning. Um, in the Myanmar situation, and other countries as well, recently authoritarian ones, the regimes have tried to shut down the internet and even mobile phone service to try to prevent major mobilizations of people. The problem with this, of course, is that the modern economies of the world are all using internet yeah. and mobile phones. And so right. governments are actually destroying their own economy uh, by trying to stop their people from using it to mobilize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's like closing the street or the avenues in your in your town. It it's it's a counter-effective because no one, no business can be developed. Absolutely. So I had another um, 
look at, at, at the story where um, I see the youth as being more non-violence and as the age, and, and if we go to older generation, it seems to be then violence become more part of, of one's life. And, and, and so, um, I mean, because we always talk about, you know, I mean, I can ask you, does the book is going to go to schools, does people going to educate the youth and so on and so forth, who is like the normal uh, way of going about this type of, of proposal. Um, and, but how can we teach older people about nonviolence? I mean, because I really think it's, it's a big issue. We saw it with the Colombian peace process where the vote uh, ended up being uh, no, uh, and then the, the next day the youth were on the street and, you know, where them did you vote and nobody vote. But anyway, so the youth were in favor of nonviolence, they were in favor of the peace process, and, and, but the, the, the youth in, 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 and, and the older generation have a little bit more difficulty with it. Does this make sense or? <laughs> well, I think so. The um, there often is a problem with uh, young men wanting to use violence to try to meet their needs, and this is understandable because young men's comparative advantage uh, to the rest of the population is their upper body strength. And so it's yeah. understandable that young men want to use that comparative advantage to try to get what they want. The problem is that we know that most struggles uh, that we've studied in the last hundred years, that nonviolence is more effective than violence by its factor of two to one. Yeah. And we also know that the most important variable for success in people resistance movements is the uh, amount and intensity of, of participation. And so if we see 3.5% of a population participating in a sustained way, that is a great indicator of likelihood of success. And if you only have young men throwing stones, Molotov cocktails, or trying to fight with guns, this does not allow uh, women, elderly people, and children to participate as much. And so the strategy might feel good for younger men, but it's a way for younger men to dominate a movement, but also lessen the likelihood that they will succeed. So we're trying to let people know that in order to win, we need to maximize participation. And to do that, the best way to do that in most circumstances is nonviolent struggle and action. Yeah, yeah. So, so my question was, how can, we, how can we reach out to the older people? Because, I, I mean, I agree with you about the, the, some violence of the youth generation, but this seems to be, as a majority, nonviolence, where the older people have a little bit more, I mean, if I talk with my family about nonviolence now, they were like, yeah, blah, blah. I mean, they, it seems to be a little bit complicated for them to understand uh, the, the power of nonviolence as they become older. Yes, that, that does happen. That It's complicated. Generally speaking, in most societies, power is held by older people. Exactly. Economic power, political power in particular, yeah. That's are right. held by older people. They tend to be the ones who are in control. They're the ones not trying to uh, uh, change the system, but defend the system. And they usually have the the, the police and the security services uh, under their control. And so it's not yeah. that older people tend to be uh, um, at least more conservative. So that's one. Um, and then uh, I think older people um, uh, older people perhaps are uh, cynical. Uh, they've seen a lot of 
uh, nonviolent struggle done that's poorly done, that's badly done, that's not well planned, that's not very nonviolent in some cases. And nonviolence can be uh, a, um, a sign of weakness, marginalization, uh, and uh, it can be perceived that way that people are protesting because they're not powerful and don't have access to the normal levers of power. So it can be a sign of, of, uh, of weakness. weakness. Yeah. And, yeah. and some older people interpret protest to be a sign of weakness. So let's go back to, to the book. Uh, how do you, um, um, what, what is the strategy now with, with the book? What, what, where are you, um, uh, how it's, it's, how it's um, developed, um, right. who do you, where do you sell it? What, what is uh, yes. the, the work there? Thank you. The book is free as a PDF and you can get it on the Nonviolence International website. And uh, you can purchase a paper version for a very low price uh, if you wish to. Um, and the book itself is an, uh, an update on Gene Sharp's 1973 book of the politics of nonviolent action, where he first documented 198 methods of nonviolent action. And we, 50 years later, have done essentially an update of this book, but also introduced people to the field, the modern field of nonviolent action and the many dimensions, exciting dimensions of nonviolent resistance going on all over the world, whether it's anti-corruption movements, whether it's egalitarian movements, whether it's environmental movements, uh, or whether it's going up against dictators and authoritarian regimes. There are many dimensions to nonviolent struggle today, very exciting, and we try to introduce people to some of these various movements. And um, it's a short book. We encourage people to read it, and we believe that it will be in many, many classrooms um, because they still are using the 1973 book. Oh, I see. <laughs> in some respects, now very out of date. <laughs> very good. Uh, before we close, do you want to uh, talk about any um, anything that people should know about uh, what uh, Nonviolence International is doing right now? Any workshop you are developing? Great. Um, yes. Um, Nonviolence International is really excited about our new database. We want you all to make it your own so that if you have a new tactic, you have a new uh, example of a tactic, a photograph that we can use send it to us and we will put it in the database. And so that's one exciting project. We also have the largest training archives in the world uh, in a project with Rutgers University in the United States. It's nonviolence.rutgers.edu. And if you want to see nonviolent training manuals for the last 60 or 70 years uh, and organizing manuals, we're collecting them. Please send us. Uh, your digital copies of these manuals so that we can include them, particularly in many different languages. And then finally, uh, we would welcome volunteers at Nonviolence International and people to join the nonviolence movement, because as you say, we need the young generation and the old generation to really uh, embrace nonviolence in every country, in every culture, because we will not survive uh, unless we really embrace that at all at all levels. So thank you for having me today. You're welcome. It was my pleasure, really. So I think we're going to wrap it now. And then uh, if you have any uh, any update, anything you want to share, anything, Presence it's your house. You are welcome anytime. Uh, we, uh, we really, and as I mentioned before, we really based on nonviolence and peace and against discrimination on all forms. So uh, for us, it's really an honor to have you and to share your uh, experience and, and, uh, and good luck with the book. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you very much. That was your show face to face and please keep watching your news on Presenza.com and we hear and we hope to hear from you very soon. And please subscribe in Facebook, YouTube and uh, uh, see you very soon. Thank you. <laughs>